Welcome to Agatha Christie She Watched, our spoiler-heavy look at the movie and TV adaptations of the mystery genre's greatest writer. I'm Bill Peschel of Peschel Press, publisher of the annotated novels of Agatha Christie, and today we're talking about friendly guard puppies, ballet dancers, Las Vegas showgirls, and Greek tycoons. We're talking about the 2017 movie Crooked House, starring Glenn Close in A Galaxy of Stars. But first, let me introduce my partner in marriage, as well as crime of the fictional kind, Teresa Peschel. Hello, Teresa. How you doing? Hi, Bill. It's always such a pleasure <laughs> to join you in your dim little office under the stairs. It's very quiet, actually, in our dim little office under the stairs, because it has no outside access. So it does make, I hope, it makes for a better sound quality for the podcast. And it is literally under the stairs of the house, so it's not that big. The previous owners, I think, made this part of a playroom. For the children, and they had like a little neighborhood underground daycare center for the neighborhood kids. Something like that, yes. But now we have it lined with homosote panels to use as bulletin boards and lined with books. It's a cozy little niche. So let's get started on today's movie. We rewatched Crooked House from 2017. It stars Glenn Close with Julian Sands, Amanda Abington, who played Watson's wife on the Sherlock series, Gillian Anderson, and Christina Hendricks, if you remember her from the Madman series. And I'd also mention Terrence Stamp, who is a long time movie actor. He plays Chief Inspector Taverner. I want to say that he was one of the villains in a Superman movie decades ago, but maybe I'm wrong. No, I think you might be right. I'd, I'd have to go look that up and double check that. But he's one of those names, of course, with a name like Stamp, you know, he does print himself on the mind. So <laughs> I would have thought that it was his his voice, his wonderful voice and slightly sardonic attitude that oh, does it. Master of the brooding silence. Oh, that's right. He was General Zod in Superman and Superman 2. Oh, so I guessed right. You, you, you didn't guess. You knew. He has a long, long list of, gosh, he's 84 years old and still active. So good on him. Indeed. Well, like you say, in this case, he's playing Chief Inspector Taverner, courting Charles Hayward, the character. Uh, who's by... being played by Max Irons. And Max Irons is Jeremy Irons' son. And I think there's some actress or other who is his mother. And sadly, it does not appear they inherited any talent from either parent. <laughs> I wouldn't go so far as that, but on the other hand, he didn't really acquit himself very well. In this well, he's role, a good-looking but... young man. He's a good-looking young man, and I'm sure he's far more personable in reality than he is when you are watching him in the movie. Crooked House, this is the only time, to my knowledge, that it has been filmed. And it was filmed in 2017. A couple of years later, I happened to be at the library. We were all in the throes of the pandemic, and I was allowed back in the library, and I wanted to find something to watch. We had never watched Agatha Christie movies before. But we were annotating classic Agatha Christie novels, and we had plans to do a lot of them, and we did end up doing six of her novels. And I thought, wow, this is an Agatha Christie movie. It's a mystery. We like mysteries. We've never seen an Agatha Christie film before, because I hadn't, not even witnessed for the prosecution. So we brought it home. We watched it, and I really enjoyed it. And I wrote a review. And then sometime later, we got another Agatha Christie film, and I wrote a review. And then I think one more after that, Bill said, you know, maybe we could do something with this. Maybe we should publish a collection of these. <laughs> and suddenly, here we are, having watched nearly 200 film and TV adaptations. Two and a half years later. I have to say, I really enjoyed Crooked House the first time I saw it. I did not enjoy it nearly as much the second time. The flaws were much more noticeable to me. But of course, I've also now seen almost 200 adaptations of Agatha Christie novels. And you can see when they hide the clues and when they do the investigation really well. And there are other times when you watch and think, man, this really drags. Of course, there's plenty of English country house porn on full display. My God, that house. It is a crooked house. It is absolutely immense. And then when you were walking around inside, it's even more immense. It's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And it has the really unique feature. And I could see this in a house that is big enough to be a hotel that houses 200 people that 
members of the family, in particular Clemency and Roger Leonides, you go through the door and they have completely redecorated their suite to look different. They were very modern, very late 50s. Or you go into Brenda Leonides' private bedroom and it's all pink suitable for a Vegas showgirl. And you don't know what you're going to see on the other side of a door. And this was intentional. They had decided to use one house, which was Minley Manor in Hampshire, for the exterior. And it was a house that had apparently been under the control of the army for a long time and was now being turned back. So it was kind of run down and overgrown on the outside, kind of the perfect gothic atmosphere for what they called a noir movie in color. And I thought about it and, you know, they're right. It is definitely shot many times like a noir film, which again is something I would have never realized before we started the Agatha Project and I watched 200 Mysteries. But they also did for the other bedrooms. They went to other houses for the interiors because they also filmed at a place called Tynus Field near Bristol, Raxall, Brixall. And they also filmed at Hugenden Manor in Buckinghamshire and West Wycombe House in Buckinghamshire. So they combined a number of interiors and they did decorate them for about the 1950s because you mentioned Brenda Leonides, played by Christina Hendricks, who was a Las Vegas showgirl that Aristotle met in Las Vegas and then ended up marrying. And married for all the reasons that wealthy tycoons marry Las Vegas showgirls. <laughs> we know the answer to this question. Why did he marry her? And we know why she married him. Yes. And the bedroom is done in pink colors. There's a big, almost pop art-like Andy Warhol-influenced portrait of her over the fireplace. The furnishings are appropriate for the era. And it's fascinating to watch. It's a beautiful film to watch. Oh, it is. It is absolutely gorgeous. Even Eustace's bedroom, he's in the unpleasant only son of Philip and Magda. His bedroom, you can see that it was a teenager taking over what used to be a castle room because he's got his <laughs> rock star posters underneath deeply detailed crenellated molding. The right. contrast is just wonderful that he is trying to put the stamp of the modern era on top of something that is resisting underneath. <laughs> <laughs> this novel is one of two that Agatha Christie said was her favorite along with Ordeal by Innocence and they're both involving conflicts within families. In this case the Leonides family founded by Aristide. So Aristide? Uh, Aristide? Yes, Aristide. Aristide. If you think of Aristotle and Nassus because they're both Greek, they both come to the country poor, they both make Millions and millions. millions and millions of dollars. And he starts off the movie by dying. The doctor realizes very quickly that it was poison and he is a control freak. He likes poking you with sharp sticks. Sophia, his granddaughter, tells our intrepid investigator Charles that at his 86th birthday, he made a point of saying that his eye drops, if they were poured into his insulin, would kill him. Now, why would anybody say something like that? except that you want to stir the pot. It's almost like he was daring someone to do something. I don't know that he was daring someone, but if you read the novel carefully, and I looked it over again, I think that Aristide knew there was something wrong with his granddaughter, Josephine. And this is a spoiler-heavy podcast, so I'll tell you right now, folks, if you don't want to know who done it, turn it off, go read the novel, and then come on back, or watch the movie and come on back. The movie is actually pretty accurate as movies go, but I think he knew there was something wrong with his granddaughter, Josephine. And that's one of the reasons why he had her and her family in the house and she wasn't sent off to a nice boarding school, as you would expect for a nice young English girl of that class. She would yeah. have been sent off to a school. I think she was 12 years old. At she was the time 12 of... and still had a tutor at home. Mm -hmm. Eustace had a tutor at home, too, and that was even more unusual, but Eustace has a limp from his palsy, and he would have been bullied. But again, I look at that and think, well, maybe lots of English boys went off to school. You were expected to be bullied. <laughs> well, none of them liked it. Prince Charles had talked extensively about being bullied at school, and let's face it, nobody should like that. Nobody yeah, nobody likes that, that. and sorry. that's why he sent his sons to Eton, which was <laughs> far more civilized in every way than that Scottish hell that he got sent to. Mm -hmm. I think that Aristide knew there was something wrong with Josephine. And watching it the second time, I think that Edith, that's the Aristide sister-in-law played by Glenn Close, I think that Lady Edith was starting to realize that there was something wrong, too. She's watching Josephine, and you don't even want to think what you're thinking, because it's so awful that Josephine murdered her grandfather because her grandfather told her no. 
And there's a scene where Lady Edith is in Josephine's room and she finds the notebook and she opens it and she looks appalled for just a moment and then she hides it. Because Charles walked into the room. And I think that is when it was confirmed to Lady Edith that Josephine was a bad seed. She writes in there, it's a combination dream book, sketchbook, diary. She confesses to everything in there. Yes, today I killed Grandpapa. He yes. told me I couldn't be a ballet dancer because I was clumsy and I wouldn't be any good at it. And he deserved to die because he told me no. And so I killed him. And I'm, and I'm so clever and I'm happy about it. And I'm so clever. No one will ever know. And then she confesses to setting up Brenda and the tutor by copying the florid. Forging, forging love notes. Forging love letters, copying the florid prose from her father's unpublished screen play and then later on she kills nanny for basically the same reason that she killed her grandfather well, she nanny thought, told nanny her was suspecting her. nanny was starting to sus be suspicious but nanny also was controlling her nanny was telling her no and josephine is a psychopath and i think that this is the only agatha christie novel in which she uses a child as the murderer she does murder children on occasion don't you believe that she writes cozies because she murdered children <laughs> in halloween, halloween party, party several of them and she murdered children off stage in by the pricking of my thumbs so agatha doesn't hesitate from murdering little kids but i think josephine is her only murdering child so we have the leonides family very twisted okay so we have glenn close who plays lady edith sharply she wonderful. is wonderful absolutely wonderful she is a matriarch with a sense of humor i have to say i kept admiring her hair this beautifully braided hairstyle but it wasn't a braid and i was wondering how they did it again this comes back to one of the signal flaws with this particular movie and they did give you a line of dialogue about how because of the trauma of mr leonides death that the servants were given the couple of days off well, no, you still have to produce food for all of these people. Somebody still has to go through and dust this place. Two days afterward, three days afterward, you still haven't got the servants back. You should have seen the cook. I mean, we're watching this dinner party scene with this elaborate dinner on the table for, let's see, the entire Leonides family, which means we would have Philip, Magna, Roger, Clemency, Sophia, Eustace, Mr. Brown, the tutor, Brenda, the unwanted widow, Lady Edith, and Charles. Uh, Charles as a guest. Ten people. They are not eating takeout. And they're not working from a buffet either. So you never see any of the servants who are running this place, and I guarantee you there were servants. At a minimum, Lady Edith had a lady's maid. The gentleman may have shared a valet. Somebody was doing that laundry, and somebody was cooking all that food and then doing the washing up. They weren't eating off of paper plates, eating fish and chips out of newspaper cones. And if you didn't see our discussion in episode 40 about Hercule Poirot's Christmas, the French version of it. Which did not have Hercule Poirot in it. There were servants everywhere. Everywhere. And they played a big role in the story and in the life of the house. We got to know them almost as well as the residents of the house. In fact, we did know them, some of them as well, because they were main participants in the story. And yes, the servants know everything that is going on, but just because the servants live in the house and know everything that is going on, they'll be loyal to you if you treat your servants well, and they aren't going to talk to those nosy reporters. So we have the Leonides family. Aristide, who's no longer there, we have his widow, Played Brenda. by Christina Hendricks, the yes. Las Vegas showgirl. The va va -voom redhead. All right. There's Lady Edith. And then there are the children. Yes, he had the only surviving children in the novel. He and his wife had eight children and only two survived the vagaries of time and the war. And that is Philip, his oldest son, who married Magda. And they produced his only three grandchildren, Sophia, Eustace, and Josephine. And then his younger son, Roger, who married Clemency, and they do not have any children. And Clemency, by the way, for all of you who are thinking that, oh my God, a woman of this class would not work, she is a senior chemist at, uh, was it Roach Laboratories? Yeah. Uh, they said something about the laboratory and that she and made a point of saying she was a senior chemist there and knew, knew about poisons. And she, yes, she knew her stuff about poisons. So she actually had a job, whereas Magda is she's an, an actress. She's an actress, but a very and poor one. Of, <laughs> probably apparently. not a very good one. Played by Gillian Anderson, by the way, from the X Files. And this is where time makes fools of us all because, but I think they also played her age up here because she looks like an actress who has been 
through the mills. <laughs> you <laughs> know, mills. wonderful Cleopatra like hair. Yeah. You know, great hairstyle with the bangs, a very uh, almost asymmetrical uh, hair and she wears kind of like Egyptian themed jewelry and in one of the scenes you see a picture of her done up as Cleopatra. Oh really? Oh what yeah, it was that? in it was in uh, one of, one of the scenes I can't remember, but it was a picture of her in full Cleopatra regalia like on a stage presentation. Oh, that must've been fun. She is not very good probably at what she does and her husband is the kind of historian who writes lengthy unreadable tomes that nobody will ever read but at least apparently he does publish his books and he has now written a screenplay so that his wife can become an actress in hollywood and they just needed a couple of million dollars from aristide who refused to provide it to him so yes, there's a motive have. for murder there but he, he reminds me also of the father in ordeal by innocence who was also he was an egyptologist who wrote books that nobody read either if i remember correctly an ordeal by innocence leo who every adaptation that i've seen was less like the name leo <laughs> and more like neutered tomcat neutered overweight house cat and declawed too he's the kind of author who never finishes anything whereas i think philip leonides has actually yeah. published books but um they were just books no one wanted to read but no but nobody wants to read them and sometimes agatha really i think does have fun sometimes with authors because she has her alter ego ariadne who is very successful writing mysteries about that uh, vegetable eating finn but she's got miss marple's nephew raymond west who is a very successful very well-paid literary novel and how she must have snorted about that and i think he was like a playwright as well and then you get the father in in ordeal by innocence and he never published anything and then you have philip leonides who is a scholar but who has apparently managed to publish without ever anybody reading it and then there was maureen summerhays's husband and mrs mcginty's dead who is trying to write a book and it doesn't look like he'll ever finish either just get on with it and tell the story <laughs> Very good advice. We come to Charles, who is played by Max Irons, and he is a private detective. He was part of Scotland Yard. Was he part of Scotland Yard? He was Yard part of the time? diplomatic service. He was part of the diplomatic service. He wanted to go into intelligence. He was stationed in Cairo, and he started keeping company with this pretty hot strawberry blonde named Sophia. Sophia de Havel. And obviously, he wasn't much of an intelligence agent because uh, he didn't even read the society columns, which would have said Sophia Leonides is in Egypt. <laughs> he didn't read the society columns. He had no idea who she was. They were keeping company and wow, why wouldn't he keep company with this hot strawberry blonde? And then he is approached by somebody higher up the food chain who says, we want you to spy on your girlfriend because she happens to be the granddaughter of Aristide Leonides, who we know has CIA ties and, and is involved somehow in the Greek Civil War. And this is after World War II. And everybody is looking for communists under every bed. And in fact, that even comes up in the text about communists once or twice, because Mr. Lawrence Brown, Tudor, is probably a communist. And Charles refuses. This was really badly scripted because apparently he and Sophia were, uh, if they weren't having a, uh, a, a full-blown affair, they were very, very close to it. Oh, they were having an affair. No man sits in a bedroom with a woman who's naked except for a sheet around her strategically placed. So okay, so they were having assume. Okay, so they were having an affair and apparently they had some kind of a blow up which we never see and they refer to it so poorly that you're not sure who broke it off. Did she break it off because she found out he was spying on her? But the implication from what I saw is that he refused to spy on her and resigned and resigned and went back to London and set himself up as a third rate private detective because he wasn't going to work for Scotland Yard. And how did he manage to pay for that big office? That was a pretty nice office. Although it was in a kind of a crummy, probably a crummy part of town. It didn't look like a, a swank office. In fact, the secretary, who was amusingly named Miss Ackroyd after Roger Ackroyd, said that once they got money coming in because of the publicity they'll redo the office they could have the decorators in it's going to look so much nicer that's true but i didn't see really anything to dislike in that office because i was really mesmerized by that ribbed privacy glass and all that heavy dark wood which you could never do today without spending millions well, of a couple dollars hundred watt light bulbs would have helped too 
This is true. Like but, noir, it's all shot in very shadowy, grim areas. For and you see people part. walking away. You see a lot of the backs of people's heads for no discernible <laughs> reason, or you see their feet as they're walking down a passageway. And again, you're thinking, focus on the face. I know you have one. <laughs> Charles and Sophia had some kind of a huge blowout, and yet you never really get a good understanding of why. It's like they both decided to pick a fight at the same time and it went off their respective ways in a huff, and it was so unclear. And then she comes back at the beginning of the movie. She has to have a private detective investigating what she is sure something happened with her grandfather. If Scotland Yard declares it murder, they're going to be inundated by the press. And she shows up in his office, and all I could think is, why? I could not see the attraction between them. Now, if Charles Hayward was played by, say, Aidan Turner, who has a different attitude and probably could have done a lot more with an underwritten role, I could see why she would say, oh, I have to come back to you. You, because you are so hot, you are so sexy, you are so virile, you would be able to get me out of this. But that's the, only because you saw him in a towel in, <laughs> in the Sarah Phelps version of And Then There Were None. It I'm wasn't sure just seeing that. him in a towel. It was the way he stood back and looked at everyone else like he was observing them, like he was watching them like a predator waiting for the weak one to be separated from the herd so he could slaughter it. And the reason why this is so important is that Max Irons doesn't really have much to say. For most of the movie, he's asking a couple of questions here and there, but most of all, he's there to observe. So you need somebody who's capable of reflecting on his face the emotions that he's feeling. Yes, or somebody who looks like they're really paying attention. And I never got the impression that Charles Hayward was really paying attention. He didn't light up the screen. And watching this again, I have the distinct impression that even though the plot insists that Sophia is madly in love with him, she's still in love with him. They never gave us a good reason for it. They never gave us a good reason for the blowout. And if she does marry him, she's going to make him knuckle under and he'll do it and she'll loathe him for being a doormat. And then very soon thereafter, numerous affairs are going to follow with virile gamekeepers and studly stonemasons. This really does happen with the ladies of the English aristocracy, by the way. They do have affairs with their virile gamekeepers and their studly stonemasons. At first, there's a will in which the estate of Aristide is being distributed equally among everybody. Yes, and everybody knows what the will is. It's relatively... They witnessed it. Yeah, they witnessed it, and there are going to be no surprises. And then you get the surprise that apparently he looked like he signed it, and then he slid it into the envelope and sealed the envelope, so not even the lawyer knew that he never signed it, which means the will is invalid. And if he died with an invalid will, then that means the widow gets everything, which of course throws the family into a tizzy, because how dare that red-headed, red-toenailed hussy from Las Vegas inherit millions and millions of dollars and everyone else is left in the cold and then the real will shows up the one that gives a tiny bequest to the widow and gives everything else to sophia and she is now an extremely rich woman which means that her father and mother and her aunt and uncle and her sister and her brother and her aunt edith are all going to have to come to her hat in hand asking for money this is also a beautiful example of Aristide's almost like contempt for his own family because Sophia tells us that Aristide had told her that it is better for one strong person to have all the money than to spread the money out among weaklings. Which he's not wrong. He's Yeah, he's not he's really not wrong, wrong. Because one of the sons... Roger. Roger is incompetent at running the catering service. And apparently is going to go into receivership. Because Roger is a terrible businessman. And Philip, his oldest, writes big, scholarly, boring tomes that no one will ever read. And he's not going to run any of the businesses either. That's one reason why Sophie left Egypt, is because Aristide called for her to train her in running the family empire, which is something we learn late in the story. But again, we did not get any kind of a scene of a blow-up between her and Charles. And this is, again, where I think Aidan Turner would have done a much, much better job. Well, a better script might have helped Max Irons. It is perfectly possible. But he should have said, I wasn't going to spy on you. And that's why I quit. And that's why I left. Because I was not going to be used against you. You never get that. Yeah. You never see this. You never see him being the hero, defending why he disappeared. Because it was that 
or spy on his girlfriend. You I, never see that. Part of this is the script writers themselves because they wanted to have a certain tone for this movie. They wanted to have a very quiet, suspenseful movie. So you can't have this kind of blowout type of scene. They underplayed it. And I think they underplayed it so much that it submerged below the waters and couldn't be seen again. Exactly. When we first saw this back in the second half of 2020, 2020 September 2020, September of 2020, good Lord, a <laughs> lifetime ago, I really enjoyed it. And yeah. watching this the second time, all the flaws came out. I still think it's worth seeing. And it is the only presentation of a crooked house you're going to find. It's the only one that's out there. They did a lot of things really well, particularly using Glenn Close as Edith de Havilland. She did a wonderful job. And then the ending. They improved on the novel. Oh my God, they improved on the novel hugely because what will work well enough in a book does not work on screen. And you see Lady Edith in her doctor's office. She has already realized what Josephine is doing. She has already realized it and she has inoperable cancer and she has decided that the best way to save Josephine from herself and to save everyone else is to drive the two of them over the cliff into the quarry and die with Josephine. It can be easily passed off as a tragic accident and nobody will ever have to know and everything is covered up, which is of course what we have to do. And we see this on screen. You see Lady Edith taking Josephine out. She out tells her first cream. for ice cream and then for ballet lessons. And you see her increasing tenseness. And then you see them getting ready to go over the cliff. And Josephine is terrified. And Lady Edith is afraid too, but she's doing what has to be done. And it becomes a, even more of a tragedy because she thought she had buried the book in quicklime, which would destroy it, not realizing that Max and Sophia found it. And they're reading passages from it in the car. So they're also contributing to the climax by explaining what exactly happened. And Sophia is horrified as she reads to Charles as he is driving tensely. And she's horrified. She had no idea that her baby sister is completely batshit. <laughs> A murderer. That her baby sister not only murdered Grandpapa, but also murdered Nanny. Uh, Nanny and set Brenda and the tutor up for murder. I set them up as patsies. That would have been hung by the state. They would have been hung by the state. And she would have enjoyed it. Josephine would have enjoyed watching it. And there's this really interesting scene fairly early on where Charles, it might be at that amazing dinner party again, where there are no servants to serve 10 people, this fabulous multi-course dinner. And man, the knives came out and they are just flaying into each other. And at some point, Charles is asked what a murderer is. And he says, the person who thinks that they are the smartest person in the room, they're very vain, they're self-centered, they're convinced that the standard rules of human morality do not apply to them. And every single thing he said applied to Josephine. And that is almost a callback to the first time he meets Josephine at the beginning of the movie where she says, now that Grandpapa's dead, I am the smartest person here. She may be the smartest person, but she doesn't have the most experience and she has the least empathy of anybody in that room. The actress who plays Josephine is, I'm going to read her name off carefully, let me find it, is Honor Neefsey. Like Glenn Close, she was absolutely dead on. She had that ever so slightly creepy vibe and she looks young. And this is a time in the 1950s when you could have a 12 year old girl still occasionally playing with dolls and nobody would think twice about it because, you know, you're not supposed to be 12 and already wearing hooker wear to school. She was great. She was an amazing actress. She did a wonderful, wonderful job. And you really felt that her Josephine was crazy. And there was a reason why she was kept home from school. Yeah. <laughs> because she would have killed someone. She's 18 now, still acting. She might actually have a career as an actually... adult and not flame out the way so many child stars do. Or they just decide they don't do it anymore because we've seen this before. They do a couple of roles and then they age out and they, they take their money and go home and they seem to be fairly happy with it. Yeah. Why should I do this? Yeah. There is so much to like about this movie. If they had a better script and more, the pacing was slow. It, it, there were times when it really dragged. Better directing and a much better script, a sharper script with more for Charles Hayward to do where you could see why Sophia still pined for him. Because I could not see why she pined for him. It was like watching a Ken doll. You know, he had all of that. He had no personality. He's pretty. 
He has a pretty face, but he didn't have that masculine edge that makes somebody like Sophia Leonides perk up and take notice. She can find pretty boys anywhere. But a man, a sexually attractive man that attracts her where she thinks, oh, you, and she remembers him and she goes to him. She could have gone to any private detective in London and gotten better service. (laughs) There is no doubt about that, but he is a known quantity to her. Yeah, the only thing you can say watching the movie is he is a known quantity to her in that he did not treat her any different from anyone else in Egypt. That is true, but also it may be that it's someone that she can control that she can have some influence over that she would want. Now that wouldn't be what she would actually want in a sexual partner. Like you said, the hunky gardener looks a lot better. And also she can throw him back when she's done with him. But if you remember, there's this one scene in which Brenda Leonides goes up to Charles and she's, uh, she's distraught because she's being suspected and Charles is trying to reassure her. And Sophia comes upon them and immediately misconstrues what's going on. All of these people have absolutely terrible communication skills absolutely awful but yes so you you see a a flare of jealousy you see a flare of serious jealousy this is still what makes agatha christie fascinating to read and to watch on the screen because these are characters they have psychological depth would be the way to put it because clearly sophia is her grandfather yes she is her grandfather of all of the people you see on the screen she is the closest to him mentally and emotionally you could say that josephine is very close to her grandfather in terms of ruthlessness but she doesn't have any empathy or smarts right she is not as smart as she thinks she is because smart people are very careful about what they do and you could see unlike aristide and his future being able to pick up brenda in las vegas and and marry her and have a fling sophia doesn't have that same possible outcome it's going to be difficult for her to find somebody to trust to marry and maybe that's why she ends up marrying charles because he's a known quantity he loved her when he didn't know who she really was but he's going to be very unhappy and she's going to be unhappy with him too yeah they're both going to be unhappy unless he mans up yeah that i would think is going to be always one of the real difficulties because if you're a powerful woman like say look there's queen elizabeth ii Prince Philip had a really difficult role to play because he wasn't the boss. He always had to be two steps behind his wife in public. And that's really hard. Mm -hmm. And he still had to be respected as a man. This particular Charles is not going to cut it with Sophia. But for the moment, he'll do. (laughs) And maybe they can find an accommodation because the best type of accommodation is if he becomes a successful private detective, he'll have his own role, his own source of strength, his own support for his ego. And he won't always be Mr. Leonides. Yeah, he won't care. He won't care. As long as he doesn't care about that. Yeah, as long as he doesn't care about that. There was so much to like about it. I'm thinking of Gillian Anderson as Magda. I mean, she just stole the scene every time she was there. Theatrical and flamboyant and brittle. Certainly an alcoholic already. Very unhappy woman. But she still managed to have three children, all of whom are difficult to get along with in various (laughs) ways, including the murdering youngest. And then you get Clemency Leonides. She married Roger and she never had to have children because she had Roger to take care of. And it's really strange strange looking at her with a dark wig and realizing that that's mary watson in sherlock <laughs> but it is she's a very strong woman much stronger than the man she married oh god yes there's that scene in which roger takes the portrait down of of brenda the of the evil brenda. the evil you know the young hot cookie and he's trying to destroy it and he just he manages to to kick the panel out and then stomp on it and not damage it whatsoever and it, it is just like a 10 year old He is so ineffectual, and yet she loves him, and she's married to him, and she never has to have children because she has (laughs) Roger. (laughs) But there was so much to like. I really liked Julian Sands. I'm going to make sure I say his name right. He played Philip Leonides, and that acerbicness, that acidness. You wonder why he writes boring books, because he should write (laughs) funny books. He should write amusingly acidic books. And yet, apparently, he doesn't. You know, when he sits down, the mantle of literature falls on him, and all of the life and vigor and slyness is immediately stamped into ashes, Mm -hmm. because you can't have any of that in a book. Yes, you want to have that acidic tone like an Evelyn Waugh or a Martin Amis 
you know, somebody who's capable of just really sticking it to sticking you that and, dagger and, in deeper. And modern Oscar <laughs> Wilde. <laughs> exactly. There was so much to like about this. You know, you look at Christina Hendricks as Brenda. You know, the va va voom shoal girl who is getting older, 37 years old. She tells us how old she is. 37 years old, still unmarried, and you age out. No matter what our culture likes to tell us, as women get older, they age out, and you you don't see very many 40-year-old showgirls in Las Vegas. That is a hard way to make a living as you get older, and your beauty starts to fade, and there's always younger, prettier girls coming up along behind you, and your joints get tired of that after a while, and too. And long nights, I'm sure, and the constant attention. And then there's Aristide, and he flirts with her, and she flirts right back, and suddenly she's given what she wants. And she tells Charles this, I wanted a husband. I decided I was going to be the best wife I could be. Aristide knew exactly what he was getting with Brenda. And Roger, his son, would like to have had an affair with Brenda, but I don't think that she did. No. And I think that her and Lawrence Brown, the tutor, the tutor, they may not have had a physical affair. It's really hard to guess. Certainly, they didn't write letters back and forth yeah. because Josephine wrote those herself. They didn't write letters back and forth. And you can see that Brenda is outclassed mentally by pretty much every single other person in the room, including Nanny. In fact, Nanny feels sorry for her. And so does Lady Edith. They're the only members of the family who do feel sorry for Brenda because they're the only ones who are able to step out of being a Leonides to recognize that Brenda is a big, fat minnow swimming with the sharks. She is a snack. <laughs> she can't compete with people like this. Like I said, this was good. And I think the difference is actually thinking about it between the first viewing and the second viewing is that the first viewing, I wasn't familiar with the book at all. So it was all new to me. So it was the experience of a first-time watcher. So I have to pay attention because I don't know when the next plot point's coming up. I don't know what to expect. So And, and I knew there. the story. I knew the story going in. But it was the first time, it was the first Agatha Christie film that we had ever seen. And so now I can look at it and say, wow, this really dragged. It and did. Charles Hayward is a terrible detective. <laughs> <laughs> And both of those things could have been fixed with more active direction and with a better script. And maybe Max Irons would have done better a better job with a better script and better direction that would have told him, you need to smolder, you need to look hot, you need to look sexy, you need to look like there's a reason why Sophia Leonides didn't forget you, why she came to you instead of a reputable private detective firm like Hercule Poirot. <laughs> who's just over in the next building. Who's just, you know, like <laughs> two, the street. Two, who's like three blocks <laughs> over in a better neighborhood. She could have done that, but she didn't. Why did she do this? Because she couldn't walk away from him. But Max Irons, <laughs> God help him, he was not the man she couldn't walk away from, even though that's what the plot tells you. But the plot is wrong. <laughs> Well, I think we've pretty much buried Max's career, so let's <laughs> we can just move on. Um, but it's it's a fun. This is the only chance you're going to get to see a crooked house because right. it's the only film version. If you're starting out and just beginning to watch the Agatha Christie films, you could start in a lot worse places than this. Believe me. Alphabet murders. <clears throat> Uh, which, oh the God, Tony the Tony Randall, Randall one. one? Oh Tony my Randall God. Oh, that was neck. awful. Oh God, that was awful. <laughs> innocent lies. <laughs> the Cineford <laughs> mystery. Oh God, that was terrible. <laughs> so there are better, there, there are better movies to watch, but if you got this one in front of you, you can find it entertaining. There's, yes, there's, there's a lot, a to, lot look at. to like. There's a there's lot of a eye lot candy to here. like about it. You know, Sophie and Charles's Sophia. Sophia, Sophia and Charles's date in Soho. That was fun too. You got to see a little bit of rock and roll. And music does play a lot. They, they play it plays a big role here. There's one particular scene in which Philip puts classical music near the end, puts classical music on the record, and the camera is panning over Lady Edith in her car after she came back from the doctor and. Josephine oh, and there's a wonderful something. scene of Josephine doing her ballet. Right. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my gosh, what a great scene that was. There, there's so much to like about this. And what killed this movie was a draggy direction and an indifferent script. That's what killed this movie, because this this could be really good. Yeah. It should have been really 
good. Yeah, because there have been instances like Ordeal by Innocence, which Agatha loved, and the movie versions, some of them are just heartbreaking. I mean, that's the thing you want to get is a movie that just, at the end, when the tragedy occurs, you go, oh, here it's more like, oh, it's over. <laughs> Yes, and let me say, because I don't know if we'll do a podcast on that one, I've seen Ordeal by Innocence three times, yeah. because we saw uh, with Donald Sutherland, yep. mm -hmm. which was remarkably bad in so many <laughs> ways. We saw the Sarah Phelps, which was very interesting, and she changed the murderer, but it still worked, and I would recommend that, but it is not the Ordeal by Innocence that Agatha wrote. And we saw the ITV version, and yes, folks. Geraldine McEwen as Miss Marple. Geraldine McEwen as Miss Marple in Ordeal by Innocence, and it worked. It worked incredibly well, and it was heartbreaking when you saw what happened to Gwenda the secretary. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. And that's what you want. Movies are emotional delivery devices like books are. And you want that grief. So you don't get the climax like we did where we're watching Charles and Sophia. And I'm still thinking, you're going to cheat on him right and left. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a happy ending. This is not going to be a happy ending for anyone. Yep. Let's conclude another episode of Agatha Christie, She Watched. Thanks for joining us, folks. And remember, we do have a website, Peschel Press. We do events throughout the year. So if you look at our front page of our website or sign up for our newsletter, we will always let you know where we are going to be. And then you can come out and talk Agatha Christie. Right. And thanks for listening. This is Bill Peschel. And I'm Teresa Peschel. And we did have a little guest kitty. Lulu came wandering in and out, but she did not contribute. We'll see you all at the movies. Agatha Christie, she watched, is Teresa Peschel and Bill Peschel. Produced by Bill Peschel. Theme song, Call to Adventure, by Kevin McLeod. New episodes come out every week wherever you stream your content. If you enjoyed this podcast... You can help support us by going to anchor.fm backslash mystery and leaving a five-star rating and review, and by helping to spread the word. To advertise on Mystery She Watched, email peschel at peschelpress.com. All questions and comments can be emailed to peschel at peschelpress.com. And thank you for listening.